Welcome back to Seriously Funny. I am your host, Mashnor Kabir, and I believe in vaccinations. Today I want to discuss this new extraordinary COVID-19 vaccine, or vaccines. There's two of them right now in America in trial. The Pfizer combined Pfizer collaboration with BioNTech and the one from the relatively new company Moderna. Um who's not having a very fun time with the FDA and the regulations. Um, But that's a topic that I'm not here to talk about. Before we start, let's mention that there's no truly impactful difference between the two vaccines available from Pfizer and Moderna. They have to be stored at different temperatures and the dosage interval intervals, meaning the time between your two dosages are different. But other than that, they work basically the same and everything we're going to talk about about how these vaccines work it it applies to both of them and the theory behind both of them is the same and neither of them is more or less effective than another one it seems so you know i also want to quickly mention that vaccines are probably the most impactful invention in all of humankind and the covid19 vaccine may be the start to an amazing safer and cheaper wave of vaccines to come i'll try to put some sources into the description some of the sources are going to be from biology majors um that are you know studying for their medical exams so they know what they're talking about and and people that have you know done their own research in their college and for their graduate programs um and you know along with that i need to say i am by no means a doctor a biological researcher any of that i'm an engineering undergraduate so i'm gonna try not to talk out of my mouth or out of my balls like i'm just here to uh, disseminate information and talk out of the mouths of people that are more reputable people that are more trustworthy than i am Uh, these are going to be words from dr anthony fauci Uh, you've probably heard his name from other epidemiologists dr mike on youtube people with do's and md's and so yeah this is also going to be a very rudimentary or basic explanation no galaxy brain 800,000 iq god tier level research information is going to be in this podcast episode um getting into that just gets into levels of biology that i haven't studied and levels of biology that are extremely uh incredible and talking about it is fun but to get the understanding of how this vaccine works we don't need to go that far and so with that first let's discuss about some biology uh, somewhat basic biology so most people listening to this episode probably know the general layout of an animal cell a fun circular shape with other fun shapes in it the ones that matter the the fun shapes that matter inside of our circular shape is the cell nucleus which is a ball that stores the cell's dna or deoxyribonucleic acid which is a which is the cell's genetic material your dna you probably know this is your genes this is what makes you you uh, physically then the next structure that's fairly important are the ribosomes and these are small circular structures in the cytoplasm of the cell that use that make proteins they use mrna strands to make proteins and mrna is going to become more important and then you know yeah there is the star of the show which show which is rna or ribonucleic acid specifically messenger rna is the one that we're going to really focus on today which is also known as mrna so this is a strand that contains the code or the blueprints the instructions for the ribosome to create the protein Uh, this thing runs through the ribosome like a machine and the ribosome reads it and says all right i know what to do it makes the protein and boom boom protein is made by the ribosome again that's really basic if you want to know how this happens there's like transcriptions it's big words and big big things that happen all right if you want to know google it Uh, it's really cool but it's not going to be completely necessary to understand the basics of this covid vaccine that we're going to talk about today now to list a fact that's going to be important later when addressing some people's concerns about this vaccine rna strands cannot enter the cell nucleus meaning that it does not in any way interact with your dna after the mrna strand is created it cannot enter the nucleus and so while we talk about biology let's explain how viruses work and how the body reacts to viruses in a general sense outside of simply the sars cov2 virus so 
Viruses are a tiny organism, tiny microscopic non-living organism because they are not able to produce their own protein or produce their own energy. And because of this, they yeah, they're non-living. And so these viruses have two basic components usually. A nucleic acid, which is going to be either a single RNA strand or a DNA strand. Most viruses use RNA. Uh, it's not, there's not many DNA viruses out there. And other than their nucleic acid, there's all the second component is going to be a protein coat, which the virus is going to use to attach to a cell in your body. Um, viruses are parasitic organisms, meaning they need a host in order to proliferate or procreate. Um, and the way they do this is they stick onto your body uh, or onto your cells, and they kind of inject it with its own genetic material and magic happens we'll get into it um and yeah when the virus attaches to your cell it injects the nucleic acid into your cell cell and your cell not knowing the difference between good and bad as mentioned earlier the cell uses dna and rna to create things in this case the virus injected the instructions to create itself and so your cell becomes a factory to reproduce this virus and finally your cell kills itself and lets out the virus copies into your body and then it spreads like wildfire uh, it's like the parasites that lay eggs in your stomach and that hatch and explode your stomach we've all seen those movies that's basically what happens but on a micro level um if you watch videos, I mean, yeah, really great stuff. It's pretty incredible. But yeah, not a good time. The viruses basically hijack your cell and make it into its own factory. And then that gets bigger and bigger as the virus spreads through your body. And of course, after, again, a lot of micro things, the immune system is an extremely complicated system. And we're going to just barely touch on it here, um, uh, right here. So yeah, after your cell goes boom boom and after you know this production things start your some alarm bells will ring because of the cell membrane has some cytokines and other things going on in there um and other cells in your body uh, which is going to be a group of cells specifically and it's an extremely complicated group of cells these are probably one of the most complicated things that or complicated uh what would you call it processes that go on in the body and this process is going to be uh, or and this group of cells, or at least this is, they're called the immune system, right? And so, uh, the this immune system is going to act when these alarm bells ring. And so, this is where we simplify the story to an absolute zero-year-old information, smooth brain type of information. Okay, this is by no means what like is the only thing that happens. It's extremely, extremely complicated. If you want more details, watch a Kurtz Gazat video or a Crash Course video. Anyways, after the alarm bells are rung, after a lot of things happen, these fun cells called B cells or memory cells come around and shoot some antibodies, which are proteins created by the immune system to fight the virus. Uh, the virus infected cells and these B cells that contain the antibody instructions then earn their name memory cells by vibing in your body and your system after the virus is killed, ready to activate again at some point later in your life or some point later in time. If the virus ever tries to get in again, um, They'll activate and make sure the virus doesn't actually make you clinically ill. It, the virus may enter your system, but it'll get quite quickly annihilated. Um, so it won't actually do anything to you. And so, yeah, uh, again, this is really grossly oversimplified, but that's how viruses usually work. And with that, we can talk about how vaccines generally for the past 223 years have worked. The first vaccine was the smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner, I think. I think he pulled it out of a cow or something. A great guy. Again, this is like the most impactful invention in human history. Impactful meaning it's probably saved the most lives in all of human history uh, of any invention. And so vaccines aim to do one thing, and that's to give your immune system a jump start for viruses so that when, viruses or bacteria. When the viruses show up, the, your immune system is prepped and ready and kills the virus before it can cause noticeable harm to the body. The way we do this is usually by taking the virus we're attempting to inoculate or make uh, or immunize to. Um, and we create a weakened version of that virus by either killing the virus and injecting it into the body, freezing the virus and injecting it into the body, ripping the virus into pieces and injecting it into the body, or, or even just by creating a literally just weakened version of the virus in a lab. 
Um, and so that's how most viruses these days work. And by injecting these invaders, these uh, like innocuous invaders that can't really do harm to the body, our cells will still fight them. And after fighting them, those memory cells we talked about earlier will form and make it so that if the full virus shows up later, we already have the antibodies that the uh, we already have the antibodies and the body will automatically and swiftly kill the actual virus if we ever encounter it. And boom, boom, vaccination successful. Some memory cells need to be replenished. Others are there for a lifetime, often depending on how much effort the body took to fight the original virus. This is why oftentimes there's going to be multiple doses for the vaccine. Um, I, when you're a baby, you get you have to go to the doctor quite a few times within the first year of your life for uh, a few vaccines, but that need to be taken at certain intervals, similar to how this COVID vaccine has two dosages two dosages, and we'll talk about that in a minute uh, for why that is and, you know, what each of those dosages do. And so these vaccines work, and they're absolutely fantastic. Again, one of the greatest, most impactful innovations and inventions in all of human history. However, there is still a virus injected into you. What if we could completely remove the risk of having any symptoms or having any ill effects of the actual virus being put into the body and enter these new vaccines and... One of these are going to be the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine that we have created in the past 12 to 10 months. And so now we can talk about how does the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine work? As we went over in the beginning, a virus generally has a protein and a nucleic acid. The common name for the COVID-19 virus is the coronavirus, named for because of how the virus looks. If you've seen a picture of the coronavirus, corona meaning crown uh, in, I forgot which language, I think it was, uh, I think it was Spanish, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, the virus is a circular shape that has these really fun spikes coming off of it. If you haven't seen a picture, you can Google it. You've probably seen a picture and you don't know. But yeah, there's these like spikes coming off of it. Um, and that spike is the protein that the coronavirus uses to stick to one of your cells and then inject its, um, inject its genetic material into you uh, or into your cell. Uh, also, as we talked about, protein is made by ribosomes using the instructions of an mRNA strand. So the two prominent COVID-19 vaccines used are uh, use a synthesized or lab-made mRNA strand from the coronavirus that contains the instructions to build the spikes referred to as the spike protein. The mRNA strand is referred to, uh, or the instructions on the mRNA strand are for the, quote, spike protein, end quote. And so this mRNA strand is injected into the body, coated with a substance to make sure that enzymes in the body don't automatically just annihilate the strand. The strand then travels through the bloodstream and like the turtles in Nemo, and when they finally find a cell, the cell will gobble it up like a nice pasta noodle. And then the ribosome runs this strand like computer code and your cell, instead of creating the entire virus, which we learned viruses do, um, the cells only create the spike protein that can't actually do any harm whatsoever to your body. And so the immune system can, however, still acknowledge that this uh, thing that was built by your cell um, uh, is a foreign intruder and your body will react to that and make the antibodies and react to it as if it were a, a virus or an intruder that needs to be handled. And so the antibodies are made and so, again, there is no live virus entering the body in any way, shape, or form. There's no possibility in any way, shape, or form to get the virus or to have symptoms of COVID-19 after taking this vaccine because, again, there is no virus actually being put into the body. It is simply an innocuous, non-harmful mRNA strand that is put into the body, and that mRNA strand cannot harm you or do anything ill to you in any way, shape, or form, there's a very, very, very slight chance you can have an allergic reaction. But out of the few million people that have gotten the vaccine, I think only like the amount of people that have had an allergic reaction have been in the single digits. And those people have all been treated and they're fine. Uh, I think eight people have had a problem with the vaccine out of the millions that were treated. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. And so, yeah, uh, to uh, one last word on that is um, 
you know, the mRNA vaccines are new in use. So these, you know, this idea of this mRNA vaccine, this is our first commercial, commercially used mRNA vaccine. However, the theory for this vaccine or the theory of this mRNA vaccination and inoculation to viruses isn't a new theory. Uh, there's been research done on this and there's been, you know, they've been working on it. So, for example, the Oxford uh, University over there in the in the where are they in the UK, I want to say. I'm not sure about that. Don't quote that one. But yeah. They've been working for uh, a few years now with a program to fight, quote, pandemic X, end quote, meaning that they're prepared for some random pandemic that might have happened. And so we were a few steps ahead on this uh, on this COVID thing. Um, it might have seemed like it destroyed us and it really did very, very bad. But, you know, we were somewhat ready for it. And that's why we were able to produce a vaccine so quickly. But again, we're going to talk about that more in a minute. There are also. Yeah. Um, there was a bunch of time it took also to get over some hurdles to make sure this vaccine happened. Like what I said with the enzymes not destroying the mRNA strand, that's something that we needed to work on to make the to make your cells want to gobble the strand up. That took a bit of work. And to make sure the cell wants to actually, you know, run the code on the strand, that took a bit too. Um, the next thing we can talk about is the um, how effective is this vaccine? So first, I want to explain the difference between effectiveness and efficacy. So efficacy is the performance of an intervention, in this case, the vaccine under ideal and controlled circumstances, though this is going to be your clinical trials and clinical studies, whereas effectiveness refers to the performance in quote, real world end quote conditions. Um, so in phase three clinical trials, which we'll describe what that means more in, in more detail in a minute, the clinical trials by Pfizer, BioNTech have 44,000 people and Moderna study has about 30.4 thousand people um, or 30,400. Uh, and so far, these vaccines have been found to have an efficacy of around 94 to 95%. That's really, really high. This percentage is the reduced likelihood of becoming ill due to the virus. So we don't actually have research studies and figures on the transmissibility of the virus. So we don't know if the virus can still enter your system and you can just be asymptomatic but still be a carrier of the virus, meaning that you won't be affected in any way by the virus. But if you sneeze on someone, they'll get the virus if they haven't been vaccinated. Um, so transmissibility will be seen in the real world when, you know, as this keeps as this vaccine keeps getting uh, injected into people. So please, please keep your mask on after being vaccinated. The vaccination does not completely make it so that you cannot spread the virus. And there's also a slight chance that you're in that unlucky 5% that isn't going to be inoculated. So keep your mask on even after being vaccinated for a while. Herd immunity will be reached at 70 to 85% of the American population vaccinated. So again, just even if you're vaccinated, keep your mask on. You don't become Superman after you get the injections. Um, yeah. And, and you're, you know, when you if you go to go or if when or if you go to get the vaccine, you will probably be told that by the people giving it to you to keep your crap on and to make sure you stay safe. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is vaccine hesitancy, frequently asked questions and some misconception. So. This vaccine is different, and due to the speed of its creation and the emergency use authorization, there's a lot of questions, misconceptions, and possible vaccine hesitancy. So I, once again, saying I am not a doctor. If you have genuine health concerns, questions, or you know ideas or thoughts, or you've been or you've seen misinformation or disinformation, probably, and you're curious about something. Uh, please talk to your doctor or a licensed professional. I cannot stress that enough. I am not a professional. Um, but a lot of frequently asked questions and common misconceptions have been answered by the CDC, uh, by a Stanford faculty epidemiologist, by Dr. Anthony Fauci. And so, you know, listening to the things that they've said, I will be addressing those contentions with what they said here. So first, why are there two doses? Again, having multiple doses of vaccines are really common. This is not the first time this is happening. This isn't because the vaccine is an mRNA vaccine or anything. Most vaccines just need multiple doses because we are putting a weaker version of of the body in or of the virus into your body. So we need to make sure that those antibodies and those memory cells are strong and they last for a while in your body. So 
due to the nature of memory cells and the mRNA technology, the first dose lets your body create the initial antibodies and memory cells that your body needs. And then the second dose ensures that first dose creates about a 50% immunity. And then the second dose ensures that the antibodies are strong and that they last for a while. And that's what brings the immunity number up to 94 to 95%. Um, this isn't uncommon. Most vaccines, again, require multiple doses, sometimes more than two. Uh, so this vaccine being two, it's actually not that high a number. One of the reasons that the flu vaccine is going to have one is probably because we have to get a new one every year. So our antibodies only need to last for like about one year because the virus is going to evolve and we'll need a new vaccine um, the next year. Um, so yeah, this is double dosage thing. It's nothing to be worried about. It happens pretty quickly. Again, most vaccine dosages are going to be within the span of like two, three months. This vaccine has two doses within the span of, depending on which one you take, the Pfizer, BioNTech, or the Moderna one, uh, about one month, maybe one and a half months, a few weeks between your dosages. So it's not that slow. It's a pretty quick, uh, quick time to get completely vaccinated. And then it takes a few weeks for your body to, uh, you know, make what it needs to make. Uh, the next question that is asked by some people is, will the vaccine give me COVID? Uh, no, this virus isn't actually being injected into you, only an innocuous protein. Or an, well, that's not even being injected into you. An innocuous strand with instructions for a protein is being injected into you. The only thing that's going to be made by your body, body, only thing that's going to be made by your body is going to be a small piece of protein that can't actually do harm to your body. Um, uh, this vaccine, yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's like we're intercepting a, a telegram in World War II and, bring, and being prepared for an enemy attack. That's basically how this vaccine works. And yeah, it's not, the vaccine isn't going to be, uh, isn't going to give you COVID in any way, shape, or form. So then another question that some people are wondering and that a lot of doctors will get asked is, is the vaccine toxic or does it contain any toxic chemicals? Uh, the list of ingredients is both public and short. So if you want to look it up, the CDC lists out uh, from both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, they, they're probably, I think, required to list their ingredients for the virus or for their vaccine, sorry. And uh, if you want to go see the ingredients, go look into the ingredients. Uh, some of the things that people are worried about the most are mercury or aluminum or aluminum. Uh, and within both of these vaccines, there is no mercury and there is no aluminum. No toxic chemicals will be going into your body. So no, the vaccine is not toxic. Um, another pretty common worry is, will the vaccine change my genetic makeup or affect my genetic makeup or just affect your genetics in general? Uh, absolutely not. Your genetic makeup is held by your DNA, which is located in the nucleus of all of your cells, which, as we said earlier, mRNA strands, neither of your cell or a virus, none of these strands, uh, any mRNA strand cannot enter your cell nucleus. It cannot interact with your DNA in any way, shape, or form. So no, your genetics will not be touched at all by this vaccine. So how long, uh, another question is how long before I'm immune after both doses? So after you take your first dose and after you take your second dose, it will take about one to two weeks for the um, body's immune system to go through the motions and to create the memory cells and the antibodies that it needs to be immune. Yet again, remember, there's a chance that you're the unlucky 5%. And then there's a chance that you uh, still may carry the virus and you could give it to other people. So please continue to wear your mask after you get vaccinated. Um, uh, how much is this vaccine going to cost me is another question. So this is only for America. I don't know about other countries. In America, this vaccine is free, completely free. You probably paid for the creation of this vaccine through your taxes if you have a job or you're over 18. So regardless of insurance, whether you're insured or uninsured, you will be able to get this vaccine for free. Uh, if you get your appointment and you go to where you need to go, they will give you the vaccine as long as you can you know, give them whatever they ask for. But no, there will there is no monetary price uh, that you need to pay the hospital or anyone else to get this vaccine. It is, you are allowed to have this vaccine regardless of your financial standing. Um, so another, uh, another big concern or worry is going to be what about the side effects that we see on the news? And so 
this uh, this one's a little more complicated to explain because the news is pretty great at making you think things. Um, thinking wrong things pretty often too. And so sometimes human error happens. This happens. People make mistakes. The vaccine might not make mistakes, but people F up sometimes. Um, and sometimes every now and then you're going to get one piece of bad news. Someone got too many injections. I think this happened a few, uh, like a week ago or so. Like someone got four doses because someone didn't know that there were multiple doses in one vial. That was a mistake on the human part. Like that, you know, not the vaccine's issue. Um, but again, this is like one case. The vaccine will cause your arm to be pretty sore and the vaccine you know after you get it maybe you're not gonna feel like an amazing superman the next morning you might have to like call off work um yeah you're not gonna get the virus or anything but your arm may hurt and you know your your body is still working to fight off something like it's going to take some energy and your body is still gonna put resources into fighting the thing off so it's not like you're just gonna perform at peak capacity after you get the vaccine um However, you know, the vaccine has been distributed to about a few million people at this point, And the number of people that have had a problem is within the single digits. I think about eight people as of last week. Um, uh, you know, all of those people, again, they were treated and fine. Like after you get the vaccine, they're going to ask you to wait in the waiting room for like 15 to 10 minutes. Um, and so, you know, you'll be fine. If anything ill happens, they'll treat you real quickly and you should be fine. It doesn't seem like anyone's been harmed irreparably by this vaccine in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah. And so, you know, on a psychological and statistic level, on a very objective level, the media causes a bias by showing you the very few cases where something ill has happened. But overall, we haven't seen any legitimate problematic short term side effects for this vaccine. The media uses bias and hide statistics in order to create fear and viewership for their program, which is another day's topic. Um, as for other side effects, we have eight months of safety data for this vaccine. And in the history of vaccines, most problems have shown negative side effects within at, at most usually 30 to 45 days of the vaccine. Um, uh, you know, that's usually when s vaccine side effects happen. So within the history of vaccinology or the study of vaccines, uh, history, uh, in history, we've seen that uh, if the vaccines are going to give you a side effect, it's going to be within the few hours of getting the side effects, a few days of getting the side effects, or at the most four to five weeks of the injection. Um, but yeah, we have eight months of data for this vaccine and we haven't seen any long-term effects now. So the chances of that happening are zero to none. Um, it's just, it's not likely that five years from now you're gonna have some random side effect. Uh, it's just vaccines don't work that way, it seems. We haven't ever seen evidence of that. Um, and as for stories about old people, this is one thing that people may say, like, uh, my grandpa got the virus a week and uh, my grandpa got the vaccination died a week later or a month later. So if you're old, your chances of dying are quite significant. Like you might if you're 80 years old, like there's a it's fair chance that the next month you die. That's not to be pessimistic or rude. Like, you know, if you're old, you're going to die. Like that's how life works. Um so it's really silly to draw the causation relationship between the vaccine and a 90 year old dying two weeks after being injected. This is just another statistical bias that you understand after studying statistics, logic and argument um, and, and, you know, fallacies and st statistics. So if you see old people that pass uh, and people are saying because of the virus, it's probably not because of the virus. It's probably just because it was their time to go. Uh, and, you know, that's just how it is. That's life people pass away. Um, but yeah, long story short, we haven't seen any serious problems at this point that should worry you about the vaccination. Uh, along with that, we're still following people and still checking the safety. Again, the phase three clinical trials and studies are still going on right now, and we're still following these people. And so the information is still coming in. So, you know, keep up to date. And again, you know, talk to a professional. And then one thing that's really important to talk about are, you know, there are some people are anti-vaxxers. These people are going to be don't vaccinate your kids. I don't vaccinate anyone. Vaccinations will, they're the worst thing ever, you know. I highly recommend you never go down this rabbit hole. It's a really bad idea. It's going to cause you problems and it's going to kill people, quite literally. 
I, that's not an exaggeration. People will die and people have died because of this anti-vaxxer movement thing. Um, the amount of lives that have been saved because of vaccines is innumerable. It is in the millions. Uh, and if you consider the time of its creation now, I wouldn't doubt if you could get in the billions. Um, I couldn't find evidence for that, but the, all the studies were between like the 1900s and, and now. And the vaccines were first created in the 1700s. Um, anyways... Most people, it seems, aren't actually anti-vaxxers. A lot of people are what you would call vaccine hesitant, meaning that they have, uh, you know, shortcomings about the vaccines. Maybe they're a little bit afraid of the vaccines. Maybe they're curious about the vaccine. Maybe they have genuine questions about the vaccine. Maybe they have just seen misinformation or disinformation, a passing comment. Or, you know, again, just simple curiosity that's induced some worry. This is understandable. and It's okay. Like, this is skepticism. Um, however... Um, you know, again, it's it's really understandable that some people are not against the vaccine, but they're just hesitant to get the vaccine because it was made quickly and, you know, it's still being in trial. Like, how did this happen? And, and maybe you heard something. Um, and one of these big issues, one of the big things that causes hesitancy is that the vaccine was developed in 10 months when it usually when it normally takes about 10 years to develop a vaccine. The reason that this happened is because we as a race, as a as a species, instead of a nation, we all work together again, like Pfizer, I think, is an American company and by uh, or BioNTech, I think. I don't know. Anyways, Pfizer BioNTech is a collaboration between Germany and I think America. And so, like, you know, and then a bunch of other places like the world come, came together to work on this. Scientists from every place came together to work on this. Along with that, we put an enormous amount of resources and money into this problem. See, and that's how it worked. And, uh, and also, as we mentioned with Oxford, they already like had some sort of preparation for this. They had research behind this and what we should do if a pandemic were to occur. And so we had an idea for, you know, how to quickly react. And so we were able to react quicker within the 10 months here of this vaccine. And so honestly, the question really shouldn't be that uh, you know how we shouldn't worry about how this vaccine was made in 10 months we should actually worry about why other vaccines take 10 years um this vaccine has it really it doesn't show worry it should show you how amazing people can be how amazing humanity can be and how amazing science can be this vaccine is proof of incredible feats it's not something to worry about um and uh, also, you know, again, it's OK to be hesitant about vaccines. It happens. I was also vaccine hesitant before doing all of this research. I was like, man, you know, they made it really quickly. Like, I, I'd like to wait a month or so before I get this vaccine. Now that I've done all this research, most of my questions have been answered. All of the questions that you have about this vaccine, there are answers to those questions. Um, so and if you want those answers, hopefully some of what I've given you here have given you some some, you know, soothing to your worries. But if you still have questions or you want to talk to a licensed professional, please go talk to your doctor or licensed professional. If you have questions or worries that were not covered here or that you're still worried about, because I am just an 18 year old that did research um, again, all the sources that I used here should be in the description. The sources are from the CDC, from YouTube videos that are going to be covered by professionals and doctors and MDs in those videos. Uh, so, uh, you know, check out the sources in the description if you want to look into where all of this information that I've given you here came from. Uh, so, yeah, again, if you are hesitant about this vaccine, please talk to your doctor or a licensed professional and they should help you calm your worries. Uh, again, I was also vaccine hesitant before doing your research. It's completely understandable and completely OK. Um, you shouldn't be judged for being a vaccine hesitant. Being an anti-vaxxer is one thing, but vaccine hesitancy is just simple fear and simple worry and just concern. So, you know, that's all cool. Um, the next thing that's curious that I would like to talk about is vaccine testing in clinical trials and, you know, how this works. And some people worry about safety of the vaccine because, you know, how these studies are happening right now, especially with this emergency use authorization or the EUA. Um, so, you know, to go on with vaccine hesitancy, yeah, we can talk about these safety trials some more. So there are three clinical trials or phases for vaccines to be authorized by the FDA. This is American, by the way. Uh, I don't know how the uh, how the processes work in other countries. This is in America. Um, uh, yeah, the FDA is the Federal Drug Administration. And so this is American protocol again. So there's three stages to 
vaccination or to for vaccines to get authorized for uh, usage commercially in America. And so stage one studies is the vaccine tested on a small group of volunteers, which is going to be about 20 to 50 volunteers. Stage two studies after the stage one studies succeed are going to be the vaccine on a group of a few hundred volunteers, 100 to 200 to 300 maybe. And then phase three um, studies and trials, which we are currently in, and is being conducted right now. Uh, like we said, Moderna is on 30,400 30, and Pfizer BioNTech is on 44,000 people. Uh, this is gonna be conducted on a few thousand volunteers. And this is where we track the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. Again, efficacy being the effectiveness in clinical, uh, clinical environments, meaning controlled environments. Um, so, uh, and yeah, the reason that we are currently applying the vaccine while studying it is going to be due to the circumstances surrounding this virus as it is a pandemic. And so that's why we have that EUA or emergency use authorization. However, the CDC and the FDA have very much guaranteed that these vaccines are not being put in place if they were not safe. They're very safe and they have been shown enough to be safe enough to not cause problems to anyone. And we haven't seen problems clinically in anyone. And the few problems we have seen again are in the single digits among millions of people. And so, yeah. Um, so this phase three study, to talk about it more, is what you would call a double blind study, meaning 50% of the volunteers get the vaccine and then 50% of the people get a placebo. And we do this in order to uh, make sure that we can see the actual efficacy of the vaccine rather than just it being some random circumstance. And so the double blind means that neither the researchers nor the volunteers know who has the placebo and who has the actual vaccine. And the reason we do this is to check for bias um, within the studies and the results within both the researchers and the volunteers. Um, so. Uh, and yeah, the reason that this vaccine is put on an emergency use authorization or an EUA is again due to the pandemic nature of this virus. This EUA does not mean that this v vaccine is is not safe, but it helps remove some of the paperwork, bureaucracy, red tape, whatever you want to call it for the vaccine to get to the market and get to you and me. Um, so yeah, it really just it removes some of the paperwork required, but all the testing that needs to be done is really there and for it to get approved completely uh you know that's going to be happening right now as companies and the fda are conducting their trials and having talks about their uh, vaccines and showing the results here um so yeah and one thing that I want to talk about personally is the future of vaccines. So this is kind of just my opinion. This is where we stray off the sources and off of the off of the clinical stuff because this is just uh, this is just my thoughts here as someone who's interested in in the future of technology all the time. Um, so these mRNA vaccines, uh, these are again this is the first mRNA vaccine that's commercially commercially used here. Um, so this mRNA vaccine is actually cheaper to create because we're just synthesizing a single strand of RNA of mRNA. They're also quicker to produce. And for, uh, you know, for example, like the yearly flu, flu virus vaccine that we make, they have to be fermented in like effing eggs, and they need to be like taken care of for a few months or weeks. Like it's, it's takes a while to make those vaccines. And it takes a while to make a lot of those vaccines. It's also a lot of like labor and hard work to make those vaccines. But these mRNA vaccines, these synthesized mRNA strands, we can do this at a very large scale at a much cheaper, cheaper price than what we've been doing to now. And so with those factors, I think that these mRNA vaccines will be the vaccines of their like of the future. They're safer because there's no live vi live virus and they're showing very high potential and great efficacy. And again, 94 to 95 percent. That's pretty good. Uh, I, I didn't look at what the percentages are for other other vaccines uh, that are, you know, used with live live viruses being injected in. But yeah, I'm all for it. I mean, if they can mag make vaccines cheaper, they'll be more accessible. One of the reasons that a lot of people probably don't get vaccinated is just due to financial standing, insurance, this and that, and a bunch of other very, very sad things that shouldn't be the case when we're talking about human safety. Um, uh, you know, if we can make these vaccines quicker and produce them more efficiently, other than the fact that they're already going to be cheaper to make just due to the nature of the vaccine, making them more efficient and making them quicker to create, that's also going to lower the price. And so it's just going to remove a lot of barriers of entry to 
uh, getting vaccinated and getting uh, and making vaccines safer. It's, it's just really, I think, going to be the vaccines of the future. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, and yeah, I have a lot of hope that this is going to be a really, really amazing, fantastic, absolutely fabulous uh, invention that and, and good positive thing that's going to come out of this absolutely devastating pandemic. Uh, you know, there's always a yin and the yang, and I think this is the the yin. I believe yin is the white part, um, the yin to the yang of the virus and the pandemic that we have gone through for the past few months. Uh, again, to reach herd immunity, we need to get to about seventy to eighty five percent of Americans vaccinated. Herd immunity being, you know, um, to the point where the virus basically is not here anymore, and so uh, it won't be a problem anymore. And so, yeah. Uh, I hope that this has answered some of those questions. But yeah, with all of that said, I hope that you learned something about the SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, the vaccine for the, this virus here, uh, for this pandemic virus that's been going on for the past few months, past year. Um, uh, it's been, uh, the vaccine has been incredibly created and tested within the past 10 months. It so far seems to be an efficacious and safe vaccine. Again, if you have doubts, questions, hesitations, please talk to your doctor or a licensed professional. Um, links for sources are, again, in the description of this podcast and the video, uh, wherever you're listening or watching. If you just scroll down the description, I'm going to put all the sources right at the top. Uh, one reminder, again, I am not a doctor or a licensed professional. I am not an MD. I am not a doctorate. I am not even a associate's degree college student. I'm a freshman in college and undergraduate. I am an engineering student as well, which is quite the opposite of biology. Um, so yeah, uh, this is purely all meant to be educational and I checked through multiple human sources studying biology and studying for medical school. They're very reliable. And overall, I hope you enjoyed this episode of seriously funny. Uh, please share this episode of seriously funny to educate more people on this vaccine. This is a really, really important topic. And the quicker that we can get these vaccines out, the quicker that we can get to that 70 to 85% for herd immunity, the better for all humans and all Americans. And the quicker that we can get out of this lockdown and we can get out of all of this painful crap that we have been going through for the past year as a species and the human race has been dealing with. So the more information we have on the safety and the more we can encourage people to get this vaccine and believe in the safety of the vaccine, the better it's going to be for everyone. So please share this episode of Seriously Funny with two wherever you can. Um, I would like to say and I would like to think that it was done well. So please, again, give this episode a share. Um, the more people that are educated about this, it's going to be the better. Again, we need around 70% of America to be vaccinated to get to herd immunity. Please, please share this episode. Thank you again. I love you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay educated. I will see you next week. Thanks again for listening. Peace.